comments. And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection where faith and reason meet, intersect. I'm Doug Keck, the gatekeeper here. 1981, where it all began with Mother Angelica. Of course, uh, this is the mothership, as Father refers to it. Email your questions to us at Spitzer's University, WTN.com. It's essential to the program. Check out all the Father Spitzer's websites, the Magic Center. Dot com, PurposefulUniverse.com, and SpitzerCenter.org as well. And Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our EWTN YouTube channel, EWTN On Demand page. And as we approach Good Friday, of course, here we are in Holy Week, we want to go to our On Demand page for the Holy Winding Sheet, exploring the Shroud of Turin, something Father knows a little bit about. Five of the Shroud's leading experts provide a contemporary look at the history and authenticity of the linen believed to be the burial cloth of Christ. Check it out for free, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right now on an on-demand page, okay? Great thing to do for Good Friday and for Holy Week. Our topic, honesty, charity, and objective moral norms. Yes, they still exist, and they're from Father's book, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church. Available now through our EWTN Religious Catalog, great gift for Easter if you haven't picked something up. And our book of the month, another great gift for Easter would be Guidepost for the Journey Home, Conversion Stories with Marcus Grodi. These are great stories right out of the Journey Home program, um, 20 plus years. Uh, and of course, nobody better doing those interviews than the one and only Marcus Grodi. Check it out. Talking about somebody else who's the one and only, we have our own Father Spitzer, Mr. Universe, and always a pleasure to be with you, Father. So if you'll <laughs> kick things off, that'll be great. With a prayer. Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you during this Holy Week today to send your Holy Spirit down upon us, Doug, myself, our whole audience and staff this day, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Please also, Lord, uh, uh, bless us in this holy week to bring us closer to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And to follow up on that prayer, I just wanted to mention something that Michael Warsaw, our CEO, uh, sent out to remind all of the employees here at EW10, if they hadn't, and people that today, uh, March 27th, marks the eighth anniversary of the passing of our foundress Mother Angelica, which actually happened uh, providentially on Easter Sunday that year. And of course, goes without saying, without Mother's amazing trust in God's providence, unshakable faith, EW10 would not exist, let alone be what it is today. And of course, we all agree she was truly not only a remarkable woman, but a holy woman and uh, someone who we pray keeps uh, looking after this mission that God gave her. So I wanted to. Uh, throw that in there father so as uh you uh, bet no, as, no truer uh, no truth could be better spoken right addendum <laughs> to that to that prayer right there and speaking of mother angelica yeah. and holy week as you uh, also mentioned holy week there was an article that uh, actually catholic world report had it it came out of asi prensa which is our, our one of our spanish uh, derivatives of CNA, and it was five suggestions uh -huh. from Mother Angelica for Holy Week. So I wanted to go over what some of her suggestions. Oh, I yeah. know we're in, the, we're in the middle of Holy Week. Her first one was repent and change your life. She talks about the fact that the book, the Bible is a book to be lived, not just read. And she, speaking about the mercy of God in the passage about a woman caught in adultery, the founders of EW10 pointed out that Jesus told her, go and sin no more. There is a condition for her to be forgiven, she explained. So, you know, sometimes we get lost in that these days where we just hear about, you know, well, God loves you so much just the way you are without the idea that, you know, mercy comes, but you're supposed to have some correction in your life too, right? Absolutely. So uh, uh, that, uh, you know, rather than maybe calling it a condition, you mm -hmm. know, maybe the, the idea would be, a, you know, a firm purpose of amendment, right. um, you know, and that firm purpose of amendment is sufficient for, uh, you know, obtaining the forgiveness right. of sins. And I think, uh, boy, I'll tell you, she sure, that woman, 
uh, caught in adultery if it's the same one that uh, yeah. uh, you know is part of Jesus's ministry henceforth right. mm -hmm. uh, and if, if it is you know indeed Mary Magdalene um, oh, interesting. Uh, okay. We know very, you know, she sure, she sure did uh, mm -hmm. do that. Now, I, I'm not sure whether that was uh, the one in John's Gospel, mm -hmm. but in in any case, uh, that that woman seems to have uh, done exactly what Jesus asked. And right. if it had been me, I, I, I would have found that quite irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you would certainly hope so. Number number two. Yeah, from, exactly. Number two from mother. Remember that hell exists. You say, well, there's a lot of theologians yeah. who say there's no hell. When you're down there with this theologian, you're going to look at him and say, you know, you got me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it, it also takes our voluntary will. Right, right, you know, right, right. I mean, we can believe somebody, but mm -hmm. at some point or another, you know, our voluntary act's going to be there, and right. and uh, <clears throat> we, as I said, God doesn't have to send anybody to hell. We gladly choose it, and right. uh, and um, you know, the, the the road to perdition is uh, very wide indeed, and right. very tempting indeed, and uh, the uh, certainly the. Uh, evil spirit tries to make it as enticing as possible. Right. So um, yes, I would say that uh, that, that the, clearly uh, uh, we better remember that and keep okay. it in the forefront of our minds. And okay. you bet. Number three, forgive your enemy. Mother explained that people's great wounds originate when we can't forgive. She said that this week, I would like you before Good Friday to call your favorite enemy. That is the one you hate the most, the one you talk about the most, the one to whom you wish terrible things to happen. Call him, tell him, it's interesting she said to him, uh, I forgive you. And if the answer, <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed that, and if, I, <laughs> and if the answer is don't bother me, which is something he might say, and maybe he was talking to a woman, she was talking to a woman on the show, you don't need to worry because you're, you've already forgiven him. And so that person of reaching out, yeah. that's the part that you have to do. That's right. And, uh, you know, uh, for me, my little prayer, too, that I, I like to pray even if, uh, uh, you know, people, um, you know, sometimes they think if I'm forgiving them, they think, well, you know, I don't need your forgiveness. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, uh, I haven't done anything to you or you know, you're just patronizing me. I always just say a little prayer to God for them anyway, and I don't tell them that I'm doing it. And I just say, Lord, you're the just judge. You take care of him. You take care of her, uh, whatever it may be. Yeah. And I just put it in God's hands, and I let it go. Um, and uh, I think that's the best way to go. Absolutely. Number four, pray the rosary every day. Mother emphasized the need to pray the rosary daily since there's nothing more powerful than prayer, and obviously rosary is, a, is such a great gift to us, and it, it, it takes us close to our Lord and to Our Lady. Um, and uh, number mm -hmm. five, I'll jump to that, learn to listen to other people's problems. She said, there are people in nursing homes who have nine or ten children, none of them visit them. Why don't you go? Why don't you look around and see your neighbor? Why don't you look him up and listen to his problems for a while? Suddenly you end up saying, and I thought I had problems. She said, a blessed, grace-filled, and prayerful Holy Week I wish for you. Forgive your enemies, love your family, and have a blessed Easter. God bless you from Mother Angelica. But that whole idea of listening to other people, so many people just want to be listened to, right? Yes, that is true, or just giving them that extra five minutes or trying to, uh, um, you know, sometimes, you know, with men especially, you you want to give the uh, person who's talking to you the solution. Right, right. And really, the, you can't do it in five minutes, let alone in 20 days. So, you know, your, your basic thing is to, to listen for a while and just say, look, you know, the best I can do right now is to pray for you, um, and that I will do. And uh, you know, and to give them, you know, a, you know, sincerely some of your time, mm -hmm. but also uh, to give them sincerely your prayers, and right. and that makes a huge difference uh, to a lot of people just to be listened to. And actually, people will tell me that on the phone. Wow, you could, you'd really, uh, 
uh, you know, take my call for, you know, I said, well, I, I don't have unlimited time, but I, right, yes, right. I'm going to take your call and I want to just listen to you, but you got to, you know, you know, help me out here because right, right. I've got a lot of things going on in my life. So I do try to, to listen, but uh, I also have the great one there, Joan Jacoby, who uh, <laughs> is always encouraging me uh, to listen uh, if uh, I'm the getting I frantic right, on, on the right. schedule. Right. The I, I Joan. The I Joan, right. right. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And you, as you right. said, guys are trained to focus on fixing. So, yeah, they used to say in marriage accounts, yep. like listening with your motor running. While the person's telling you, you're already formulating yep. the solution that they haven't even explained what yeah. they really are interested in. And, and that's something that's very difficult, yeah, exactly. I think, for men to do. <laughs> so, here's another. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah. it's, here we are. We're, we're doing this show. Uh, on what's on on Holy Week on Wednesday, which is called Spy Wednesday. Why do we call it Spy Correct. Wednesday? Why do we call it Spy Wednesday? Well, uh, because you know, in the eyes of uh, you know the English people uh, who named it that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Judas was somebody who was kind of in Jesus' circle, spying mm -hmm. on behalf of the um, chief priests and uh, and the uh, religious authorities. Uh, to see where Jesus was going and what he was doing. And obviously, uh, you know, the 30 pieces of silver for the betrayal probably, you know, um, you know, he, you know, Judas probably had a few encounters with those authorities. Right. Now, you know, his motives are always so unfathomable uh, to so many people, but, you know, I, I always thought it was resentment, you know, that maybe Jesus said something or, um, you know, Jesus called. Uh, Judas to some kind of responsibility, or maybe even challenged him on mm -hmm. uh, swiping things from the uh, the money bag or something. Or mm -hmm. I, I always thought that that was it. Maybe you know that Judas resented him. Uh, I just can't fathom. Um, you know that maybe it's true. I mean, some exegetes think you know Judas was was really kind of a, a zealot. He was trying to get mm -hmm. um, you know uh, Jesus and the Roman authorities to be in. A kind of a pitched battle, and uh, you know maybe start fomenting some kind of a uh, a revolution mm -hmm. or some kind of a political activity uh, or some kind of fight back. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that that that's the case, but it it's so ambiguous. Uh, there are other people who are pure and simple, like for example John's, uh, um, you know uh, the the beloved disciple mm -hmm. John's Gospel. Uh, you know he he thinks pure and simple thirty pieces of silver. You know. Uh, it was a pretty tempting deal, you know, that Judas was getting, you know, super greedy. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, for me, that just never, that never held a whole lot of water. If I saw even two of Jesus's miracles, mm -hmm. you know, let alone, uh, you know, a hundred of them, you know, and there's just no doubt he had a prolific ministry of healing and, and exorcism, and certainly these raisings from the dead are not something mythological. Mm -hmm. uh, Judas certainly would have had to have been present at some of these things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just don't, if I had seen that, there's just no way, you know, 30 pieces of silver, uh, you know, uh, how, how bad can greed get? Now, that's a lot of money, mm -hmm. I, I agree, uh, but nevertheless, it, it, it's, uh, it's like, yeah, they, uh, you're going to betray you, you know, this man who's, you know, if you didn't respect him out of his love and friendship and, and goodness, you know, toward all the people around him, maybe you could respect him because he had power uh, to heal and to raise the dead. I don't know, but, you know, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. But I always thought, too, maybe, you know, Judas wanted to be part of the inner circle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe pride. that was the deal. And, His own pride. And envy. Yeah, pride, James. Pride, John, envy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that, that was more my think, or resentment. Mm -hmm. Pride, envy, or resentment right. uh, seemed more logical to me. But, uh, boy, you're never told. You just don't even get an insight uh, into why uh, Judas did And then the betrayal with the kiss. Mm -hmm. That's why I always thought it, it had some form of resentment or mm -hmm. hatred in it because, you know, to do that, right. you know, I mean, you could have chosen a million signs 
to betray Jesus, uh, you know, as a disciple and a friend. Why would you do it with a kiss? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, uh, are you kidding me? Right. I mean, it's almost like uh, I'm, I'm going to be in your face right. and right. I'm going to jam the old dagger right into you. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to tell you, I, I mm -hmm. never really got it. I, I, I just uh, simply, um, um, I, I just thought it had to be resentment, but okay. that's me. Uh, you know, I just didn't think there was a political thing. Greed, just, you know, <laughs> I mean, money never meant that much to me. Mm -hmm. uh, well, maybe it did at one <laughs> time, but, but uh, I, it's faded back into my memory so much. Uh, it just seems like resentment, right. envy, pride, maybe that's the deal. Uh, he wanted to be part of the inner circle, and he was always in the right. back circle or something right. and yeah. whatever. Right, and then, of course, those things, you know, are sometimes seen as, you know, you know, the idea of the devil or Satan kind of entering into it. And, but of course, that can be emblematic from those kinds of feelings and those kinds of, uh, you know, resentments as being, you know, things that were being fed by that. So, speaking of. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Of, of mm -hmm. uh, things that, ha uh, that uh, shouldn't happen, I guess. Uh, but I just wanted to mention it. It happened a little while ago, but we didn't get to it. Vice President Kamala Harris visits Minnesota Planned Parenthood facility. Uh, yeah. And she was uh, the first sitting administration, so people understand, the first sitting administration official to do so in, a na in national history. So no other administration ever has somebody go visit one of these abortion mills that Planned Parenthood runs. Uh, and of course she called mm -hmm. it a uh, health care clinic and she was there to uplift yeah. the work that is happening in Minnesota. Uh, while speaking with reporters, it goes on to say Harris praised abortion providers and lashed out at lawmakers advancing pro-life legislation. Finally, uh, uh, it turned out Lila Rose of Live Action Foundress and a Catholic wrote, even Hitler tried to hide his death camps. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are proud to publicly support mass murder. So just an uh, interesting yep. situation we're in. Yep. <laughs> Uh, well, you're not going to get any disagreement out of me. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm just uh, amazed that people are actually turning, you know, what is honestly a, a place in which innocent, um, in my view, mm -hmm. innocent human beings that can be proven to be human beings are literally being murdered. They mm -hmm. are being killed. And you're turning this into a monument of political freedom? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't get it. I, I really don't. And I mean, it, it, you know, um, <laughs> I have to tell you that the fact that it is so brazen uh, sort of indicates to me that, that uh, uh, you know, we believe our own rhetoric now. Mm -hmm. We really well, believe that black is white it? and white right. is black. Yeah. 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 Oh, I think it is, yeah, and I think it's, it's the ultimate deception. Right. You know, I mean, how do you be, push that fact into the background? You know, I don't care how, you know, reproductive rights oriented and politically oriented you are, in order to do this, and you know, like an action like Kamala did, you'd have to basically push the fact mm -hmm. of killing an innocent human being into the background. And you know, like I said, whatever it is, internationally 98% and uh, nationally U.S. 69% uh, uh, professional biologists uh, still adhere to the fact that a new, unique, substantially whole human being occurs at the moment of fertilization. Well, certainly, if you are out there advocating for second and third mm. trimester abortions, as they are in these clinics, right. I mean, y y you know, how can you push that fact back into the background? That seconds before birth, uh, you know, you can kill this child. But once, you know, they are, you know, uh, fully half of the child has emerged, uh, you know, from the womb, ah, then you can't kill them anymore unless, of course, you want to go ahead with the new infanticide regime mm -hmm. that's uh, being promoted, too, uh, by various uh, circles on the Hill. Right. So the, the, main, though, uh, the main thing uh, to me is, is uh, you know, what are we going to do, um, you know, to re recenter the fact of, you know, there's a killing going on here, mm -hmm. a killing of a new, unique, substantially whole human being is going on here, 
uh, how far to the back do you want to push this? You know, I mean, how far to the, it's like, you know, after the Dred Scott decision, everybody, you know, in the South was drinking the Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. you know, and just basically going, well, there you have it. Those black human beings are not human beings at all. It's just what we thought. Mm -hmm. They're a mere chattel and they can be enslaved get this, right out of the Supreme Court's uh, mandate in the decision. They can be s enslaved at, uh, you know, and, and right. subjugated right. to the superior race. I mean, there it is, right there in Supreme Court language. And I'm just thinking to myself, because they have this legal sanction, mm -hmm. they think that this is okay right. to enslave this entire group of people, to take their rights away uh, for one sole reason, that they came from Africa? Well, there it is, writ large in our constitutional history by unanimous Supreme Court fiat. Mm -hmm. Just saying there's something very, very strange going on here that we could get the entire American people to drink that. Well, not the entire American people, that's mm -hmm. not true. The southern uh, uh, states of the Union to drink that Kool-Aid for all that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just, you know, t it's still, right. you look at it and you go, yeah, I think people but, will believe mm -hmm. just about anything to get what they want, and they wanted slaves, and so that's how right. they were going to get their slaves. Right. And, and so, uh, you know, we, but you have to shove realities to the background, yeah. which uh, the inalienable rights of human beings, you know, scream so loudly mm -hmm. that if they didn't scream, even the stones would shout out. Right, absolutely. You know, so there's, there's well, got to be some way of right. putting reality right. back in the picture. Unfortunately, um, the, our, our devout Catholic president and his administration, <laughs> let alone his party, uh, have seemed to have d decided that not only this is a wonderful thing that should be stood up for, but that this is a great uh, election year campaign item and probably central yeah. to everything to try to overcome some of the other, I think, fairly obvious shortcomings that are out there. Uh, you know, I know we have a lot of people watch, and we're not into politics here, but there needs to be some revelations for some people to maybe take some of the scales off their eyes <coughs> of, of situations just because in the past they might have looked at a particular party in a positive way or because somebody says they're a Catholic, that means that, uh, that they're okay. So anyway, let's move on to some uh, questions from our audience. Yeah. And they go right to us. Uh, here on Holy Week, uh, dear Father Spitzer, now okay. Ca Caiaphas believed that Jesus was a threat to his power as high priest. Did he think Jesus was the Messiah or a mere mortal stirring up the people? If Jesus was a mere mortal, was Caiaphas not correct in his thinking that, that it was better for one man to die, sparing the wrath of Rome, destruction of the whole nation of Israel? Andrew. Yeah, well, Andrew, the, the issue is not whether um, Caiaphas thought Jesus was the Messiah or not. I'm quite sure that he did not right. because, um, you know, he obviously heard about Jesus' exorcisms and healings and perhaps some raisings of the dead. I don't know. But certainly they know he is popular. And Caiaphas was not looking at Jesus, you know, from the fact of, hey, I wonder whether that exorcism or that raising of the dead, uh, I wonder whether that really happened. I'd like to check it out <coughs> with one of the witnesses and that might have been there at the time or something of that nature. Now you could say, you know, <clears throat> that if Caiaphas had had an interest in that, he might have actually thought twice about what he was doing. Mm -hmm. But it's just like what we were talking about, hiding the obvious crime. You know, I, I'm not going to think about the killing of that innocent, right? I'm not going to think about, and here it is, the killing of an innocent man. Mm -hmm. That is what's going on and that is what's at issue. In other words, Caiaphas is willing to kill an innocent man. Uh, you know, whether he believed he was the Messiah or whether he didn't believe he was the Messiah. Caiaphas said that Jesus is getting a whole lot of political power. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus didn't want any political power. 
Jesus, of course, was in a struggle to say who God was and that God was interested in redeeming sinners and that all of these people out there who, you know, um, uh, Jesus was uh, basic, uh, that, uh, um, you know, the, the Jewish uh, high priesthood was considering to be a threat mm -hmm. uh, to their political power, which is, of course, a threat uh, to the uh, to their interpretation of the law, not the law itself. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not, as he said, I'm not getting rid of any laws. My objective is to bring it to fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they were the ones that were trying to turn it into a political issue. Now, Caiaphas, he's a shrewd individual, right? Obviously, he's very shrewd. And so he says, I don't care you know, um, you know about this guy, whether he's really innocent or whether he's not innocent, whether he's trying to get political power or whether he's not trying to get political power. I just know one thing, you know, I don't want the Romans coming down on us and I don't want to lose any power at the right. Sanhedrin here. Now, let's get together, boys. <laughs> we got to figure something out here because this guy is getting a little out of hand. We've got him in our power now. I mean, let's face facts. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's, he's here. Uh, we've got him on trial. I mean, the Roman authorities are not challenging us in this regard. So, uh, you know, let's, uh, uh, let's put him on trial and see if we can get the old Romans uh, to, to, to kill him. Right. You know, and so uh, it, this has become a political issue. So he says, let's go ahead and kill the innocent guy anyway because better for one guy, even though he's innocent, mm -hmm. better to let him die than to, you know, to get under the Roman skin or to have our power bases threatened mm -hmm. or to have, you know, Torah, our interpretation of Torah undermined so that, you know, um, you know, we're going to kind of lose some power or to let this guy start squeezing in on us in terms of the domain of, uh, of religious interpretation. So they basically, right. I, I view this thing as definitely a power struggle. Right. It's a little bit of a political power struggle, but it's also a religious uh, political power struggle. Uh, Jesus, of course, is not looking for a power struggle at all. Right. You know, he's basically trying to bring in an interpretation of Torah which will forgive sins that will accommodate the father of the prodigal son and so forth and so on. So he's trying to bring in a very different kind of regime and he also is trying to get, you know, let's face facts. You know, what was that tipping over of all this stuff uh, in, in the temple? What was that all about? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus certainly wasn't having a temper tantrum that day. Mm -hmm. He had been, you know, in the temple precincts many, many times. He'd seen the, the you know, the people selling the yeah, birds the and changers, selling this right. and doing that and exchanging money and so forth. Right. So he sees all this going on every day, you know, so why that day? Why does he tip things over and go, you know, you guys are bad news? Because he's making a judgment on the temple administration. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, you guys are bums. Well, I wasn't putting it that <laughs> way. But he says, you guys are inauthentic. You basically have perverted uh, things. And I'm telling you right now, with these symbolic acts, and then he tips over some tables and so forth, right? With these symbolic acts, I'm making a judgment on you. Mm -hmm. Your temple administration is going to fall, and now there's going to be a new universal temple. And it's not going to be here in Israel. It's going to be a universal temple everywhere. And that universal temple is going to be in me. The mm -hmm. stone that the builders rejected will become the cornerstone. I am going to be the new universal temple. So you can go in India, and you can go mm -hmm. in the... Uh, you know, in Europe, and you can go wherever you want, and there will be the temple because the temple is me, and the temple that is me will be through the church that I instituted, the church, you know, uh, that I have instituted uh, through uh, the, the magisterium of Peter. So basically, he has just made this prophetic, mm -hmm. you know, condemnation of the temple administration. Now, why do I point all this out? Because, of course, 
Caiaphas has heard the rumors, right? You know, hey, uh, Jesus has uh, been, uh, you know, tipping things over, mm -hmm. making uh, some judgments on us guys and the temple administration. You know, hey, listen, you know, we <laughs> he's trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, he's saying that we're inauthentic, you know, and uh, that we're more worried about our laws and about money than we are about the people and about the, the law and about the love of God. You know, he's making statements. And, of course, uh, then uh, how are we going to handle this guy? Kill him. Mm -hmm. And that's the best thing to do. And how are we going to disguise the fact that he's innocent? The fact that he really didn't do a capital offense. Mm -hmm. How are we going to disguise the fact that he really hasn't been going around lying or mm -hmm. calling himself something uh, that he has not made himself out to be, you know, like a replacement right. to the temple administration, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So how are we going to get away with this? Well, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, whether he's innocent or whether he's not innocent. It's better for one guy right. to die he's a than that all the people should suffer. He's a threat to our power and our position, yeah. and that's what it's all about. With that said, we're going to take a break. Very good, Father Spitzer. Stay there. Yep. We ask you all to stay with us. More questions on the other side of this break. We appreciate you staying with us for part two of Father Spitzer's Universe. Our topic for today is honesty, charity, and objective moral norms from Father's book, of course, the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church. But we still have some questions that we want to finish off right before we get there. Dear Father Spitzer, now Jesus died on the cross to redeem the sins of the world, past, present, and future. If that's true, why do we have to go to confession prior to receiving the Eucharist if we have a mortal sin on our souls? Thanks for the opportunity to learn and expand our understanding of everything Catholic. This is John. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, John, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, basically, the, the idea is the uh, worthiness uh, to receive uh, our Lord, um, you know, in the sacrament. And, you know, remember that mortal sin is a very serious sin that has mm -hmm. three conditions. Um, you know, somewhat, you know, uh, you know, this is, you know, you're not just committing one mortal sin after the next. Remember, mm -hmm. it requires gra grave matter, sufficient reflection, and full consent of the will. Now, maybe mm -hmm. a mafia criminal could do that mm -hmm. or, or something like that one after the next. But uh, the main thing, though, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the long regard is sufficient reflect, uh, the full consent of the will part is tough because, of course, it means no impediments to the free use of the will. But be that as it may, if you commit a mortal sin, uh, essentially, that's pretty serious, mm -hmm. and you know, just uh, you know, receiving communion almost uh, as as a mechanical act—that's the one thing that the church wanted, you know, people not to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to take our Lord almost, you know, in, in, into them. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say in a superstitious way, but in a way mm -hmm. that you know will make my sins go away without me ever having. Uh, in, in some sense, uh, to do a, a kind of a confession, some mm -hmm. kind of a, an accountability, uh, you know, to, you know, the, this priest who is sitting in the place of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so they thought that these kinds of mortal sins, because they are serious, uh, that those kinds of mortal sins uh, should be things that, um, y you know, um, uh, should be confessed. Uh, to Jesus Himself, or to be the to the priest uh, who's sitting in the place of Jesus, mm -hmm. in in a real way that that has accountability and feedback in it, and and uh, I think it's a good thing because of course the power, uh, that, and you just this is to get to your question, mm -hmm. but the power behind the love behind the absolution in the sacrament of reconciliation. That is the love that was given by Jesus in his complete self-sacrifice on the cross. Mm -hmm. So one time, right? So basically, uh, you know, when uh, Jesus uh, dies on the cross there and this unrestricted act of love is created in the world, it just doesn't go flash and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. It stays in the world. The unrestricted love is there to empower every sacrament, to empower the Holy Eucharist till the end of time, to empower 
um, you know, the, uh, the um, absolution and the sacrament of reconciliation until the end of time. It is the thing that defeats Satan every time, the light that overcomes his darkness every time, the, the, the power that breaks the grip of the evil spirit. And, and the idea of the sacrament of reconciliation is when you confess it and when you have, you know, as you're saying, your act of contrition with firm purpose of amendment, right, that is something that it breaks the, the grip of the evil spirit. It, it just couldn't be a mechanical act of receiving our Lord into you, you know, without thinking, you know, you, you have to think about what you're going to say mm. uh, uh, to this person. And the reception of the absolution is, is, you know, like when you put all these things together, you are literally cooperating in, in your freedom. You're cooperating with the act of breaking the spell of the evil spirit. So it's not just the absolution for sin. Remember, mm -hmm. the power of absolution is the breaking of the, the grip of the evil spirit. It is the healing from past sin. It is the turning uh, point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the grace of, of turning point. But, and, and of course, it is the peace that, that enables us to start again to mm -hmm. transform our lives. So there's a multiple power um, that comes from the love that's created by Jesus on the cross in this sacrament. So what the church is basically saying is for your own good mm -hmm. to break this grip of the evil spirit, for your own good, you know, to, to obtain the power of healing and transformation through this sacrament. Like I said, I, I've just seen turnarounds done mm -hmm. with the sacrament of reconciliation. Just actually doing it, just mustering up the strength to do it, just saying these sins to the priest, just receiving that absolution and meeting those conditions, right, um, you know, uh, when that happens, I have seen people, their whole lives turn around. It's almost as if, you know, y y t t five minutes ago, was one, life was one way, uh, kind of a malaise, and all of a sudden, uh, there's the buoyancy, almost the, the joy of, of being relieved of God just sort of buoying me up in this sort of Easter uh, sensibility. So anyway, I'll, I'll just uh, tell you that is the whole reason for it. Um, and the answer to your question is, it is the yeah. grace of, uh, of the crucifixion that Jesus gave to all of us to relieve all sins for all time. That's the grace that's forgiving you hmm. um, in the absolution of the Holy Spirit. And of course, Holy Communion does forgive sins, but forgives venial sins. And most sins by far are venial sins. They're not grave matter you know, committed with sufficient reflection, full consent of the will. So the idea, you know, th that, uh, um, you know, uh, th there is p the power of that love is also there in the, in the, in the Eucharist as well. And uh, so, uh, you, you know, you, you just can't, you, in other words, you, you have to do something though. And that's the whole point to cooperate with the grace that you're being given. You just can't sit around and go, well, Jesus forgave all of our sins. Right, well. Great. I think I'll just sit at home and watch football game day. Well, you know, uh, we, we got to do something. Yeah. Well, some so people we uh, go to think when God's all merciful and loves you just the way you are, that uh, that, that 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 kind of fits right into yeah. what you described. One last question before we get to the book, because uh, mm -hmm. it kind of has to do uh, with uh, Holy Week, kind of. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. why do so many disciples of Jesus not recognize him after the resurrection? Mary Magdalene thought he was a gardener by the tomb. His disciples on the road to Emmaus did not know him until the breaking of the bread. What was so different about his physical appearance that prevented some of his closest friends from recognizing him? Amy. Uh, Amy, uh, let's split the two, uh, the resurrection narratives into two kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, the ones to the women, uh, which seem to, um, uh, you know, or, or Jesus seems to be present in a, a more bodily state mm -hmm. uh, in that particular case. And, and he does seem to keep his appearance hidden. And the reason uh, that he does is he wants them, he wants, you know, Jesus wants, is, he's the he, uh, Jesus wants them to recognize him uh, in their hearts. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with Mary Magdalene, you can see pretty clearly that what Jesus is kind of looking for in these initial kinds of appearances um, is uh, he's looking for them 
uh, not so much to see him and say, oh, that's Jesus from the ministry. He, he hides himself so that Mary finally hears his voice mm -hmm. and hears the way he's pronouncing her name. And then, of course, she goes, Rabboni. You know, in other words, she's got him fixed in her heart mm -hmm. and she recognizes. Same thing with the uh, apostles on the road to uh, um, Emmaus or Emmaus, as we mm -hmm. sometimes pronounce it. The main thing is they're uh, going uh, down uh, the road and Jesus hides himself. Uh, you know, he doesn't, you know, you know, remember, he's no longer a, just, a, you know, a physical body. He's not just a resuscitated corpse. Mm -hmm. He is, uh, you know, transformed, and he can take whatever appearance he wants. So he comes down like a stranger, and he says, so what are you guys talking about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the way here? And, of course, these guys go, haven't you heard, you know, all the things that have been going on? You, no, what thing? You know, and yee, yee, yee. <laughs> they keep right. reeling them in and reeling them in. So so, of course, as he's reeling them in, right. you know, uh, finally, of course, they're getting hooked on him. And so, uh, basically, uh, you know, Jesus says, well, I've got to go. And they go, no, no, you know, you know, why don't you come in with us? We've got food, you know, uh, well, well, uh, come on in. So, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, he has already been opening the scriptures to them, mm -hmm. and they're hooked on him. And so, you know, at, at that point, he, uh, you know, reveals himself in the breaking of the bread. Again, mm -hmm. it's the identification of him in their hearts and seeing the breaking of the bread, you know, being hooked uh, by his words, et cetera, et cetera. Now, mm -hmm. uh, so that's, let's call those, uh, you know, I'm gonna call them pre, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, still these appearances are initial appearances. So um, uh, he, he's making these appearances to Peter and to uh, the Emmaus group, the, to the women. And so what's the objective? Go gather my apostles mm -hmm. and disciples and bring them together. Then once that first gathering gets done, notice that the appearance narratives change and so you get another kind of appearance narrative. So in the group appearances, like in the closed room, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus appears through, um, you know, the locked door. So there's no appearing along the road. He's going right through a locked door. And of course, he is uh, obviously transformed. Mm -hmm. John's gospel starts calling him uh, you know, ha kurios. So the apostles, when they see him, they're calling him the Lord. They're not calling him Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're not calling him master. They're calling him the Lord, which is the translation of the Hebrew Adonai or Yahweh, mm -hmm. right, the divine name. Mm -hmm. And so throughout all of John's resurrection narratives, the apostles, right, no one dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew very well it was the Lord. Mm -hmm. There it is again, uh, the divine name um, uh, with the definite article, the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now you go, well, why would John make a cryptic remark like that? Why would anybody want to ask who he is if they knew very well it was the Lord? Well, if he was the Lord, then he's appearing in glory and power, right? He's appearing in a very transformed spiritual way. Mm -hmm. He's very shocking to them and so forth. So they're going to go, is that Jesus? The Jesus who was with us in the ministry? And of course, then Jesus reveals, right, his uh, hands and his feet and, mm -hmm. and so forth, as we see in Luke's gospel and in John's gospel. Now, in Matthew's gospel, we see the same uh, a transformation uh, in divine glory because when Jesus appears on the mountain what do all the apostles do right off the bat BAM they bow down in worship mm. and we know one thing about Matthew's gospel you shall worship the Lord your God alone mm -hmm. him alone shall you serve so if that's the case then you can pretty much see that what um, uh, Jesus is, um, uh, you know, he's transformed. Mm -hmm. if, if everybody bows down and worships, uh, that's the first sign. And then what is, just in case you didn't get it, mm -hmm. Jesus announces to his apostles, full power and authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given over to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
That would mean God, right? There's only one being that has full power and authority in heaven and on earth, and that's God. And all that divine power and authority is now in Jesus very clearly manifest. He is appearing in divine glory, and then he says, go therefore and baptize the nations, etc." So you can tell right away in Matthew's gospel, you've got the same transformation. Let's look at Luke's gospel. Again, we got another, what I'm going to call highly transformed divine glory and spirit. Uh, there to, and by the way, uh, why does Paul say, you know, what is, you know, sown in, in uh, ignominiousness is going to be raised in glory. What is sown in weakness will be raised in power and strength. What is sown? Well, why does Paul use all the power language and the spiritual? In fact, he winds up calling Jesus not a, a risen body, but a pneumati consoma, another uh, uh, you know a, a, a spiritual body. So of course the idea uh, for Paul is, yeah, he's transformed in power and glory and spirit, and we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so we're going to be transformed in his power and glory and spirit. And then we get to Luke's gospel when you know Jesus appears. Uh, you know, first of all, what's the first thing uh, uh, you know Luke says? The not that they thought they were seeing a ghost. They were terrified and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit, right? So he's transformed. There's something different that's going on. So just split those two resurrection narratives into two kinds. The first kind are uh, like to Peter, to the uh, women, and to the uh, disciples on the road to Emma House. In other words, he looks kind of like a human being in a physical body, and, and uh, you know, he's uh, you know, appealing to them on that level. Whereas if you go then to what happens after the disciples make the announcement to the 12, and then from the 12, we presume to the 500 uh, brethren, most mm -hmm. of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. As this thing is going forward, notice that the appearance is much less bodily, and it turns into a spiritual powerful, glorious experience, like God is appearing mm -hmm. in front of us in power, glory, and spirit, and that's the kind of, you know, thing that the groups of the apostles are getting, and when they see him, they're bowing down and worshiping, or they're calling him Hakurias, they're calling him the Lord, the divine name, and so forth in these uh, gospel readings, and in addition to that, he uh, is very scary and awesome and glorious. Right, he's 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 uh, uh, you know evoking this awe and and and, and majesty and, and worship. So the idea, uh, you know, is that he's now in a very transformed uh, state, a very powerful and divinely glorious uh, state. And mm -hmm. so um, uh, the but then of course they get confused and go, is that Jesus? Mm -hmm. And then. He says, look here, you know, look at the wounds in my hands and my side or right. my hands and my feet, you know, and see that it is me. Okay. So, of course, why would they, why would Jesus have to do that uh, unless, you know, there was some kind right. of a, a, okay. a feeling? But what a great question that is before right. Easter. <laughs> okay, perfect. And that's why I wanted to let you finish that. Let's just move quick in the last couple of minutes, a little bit on the book. Sure. Uh, you said on page 300, uh, you talk about the Enlightenment, uh, and we hear about it all the time, but you say that the Enlightenment ideal led to a progressively more mm -hmm. radical view of freedom, and that would be that freedom is an end in itself. Why is that such a problem? Yeah. Well, the, well first of all, you know, um, whether you were a romantic like Rousseau mm -hmm. or whether you were uh, like a Voltarian, a, a kind of a rationalist, a sort of atheist, materialist kind of a thing, it, it really didn't matter mm -hmm. uh, whether you were on the Voltaire side or the Rousseau side. They both had this idealization of freedom as an end in itself. Mm -hmm. That is to say that, you know, my freedom is the reason for my life. Mm -hmm. So that it's not freedom so that I could do something. It's I exist to be free. Mm -hmm. Now, the moment you say I exist to be free, then, of course, you know, by doing everything that I want, I am literally my my the reason for my existence, my raison d'etre is fulfilled. In other words, my reason for living is fulfilled simply because I have, you know, lived, 
you know, my way, the Frank Sinatra song, right? right, right. I did it my way, and that's my reason for living. Mm -hmm. Whereas, of course, Jesus would say, that, that is a perfectly awful reason to live, right. to be yourself, to do it your way. Jesus would say, the re reason that you want freedom, the reason you want self-empowerment, the reason you want self-governance, the reason you want self-determination is so that you can do the good for others and the good for the kingdom, so that you can make a real positive difference with your life. You want to be free to do something beyond yourself. It's not to serve yourself. That's the whole point. And so what happened in the Enlightenment ideal mm -hmm. was somehow, I mean, like, you know, Thomas Jefferson, for example, he, he really didn't have that kind of enlightenment ideal. He really did want to serve his country. Mm -hmm. He did want to serve the people. He did want to serve a democracy. These guys were very self-sacrificial uh, guys. You know, they, 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 they certainly had that, but they played into uh, this idea of almost freedom as an end in itself. And John Locke tried to warn people about this. He said, you know, there's a problem with this enlightenment ideal. Mm. You know, you just can't sit there and bat freedom around as if all that matters is being free. You know, give me freedom or give me death. Mm -hmm. No, it's give me freedom so that I might use the powers and the faculties that I have in that freedom to make an optimal positive contribution to my family, to my friends, to my community, to my church, <coughs> excuse me, to the kingdom of God, and uh, to the culture, uh, to the society, if I'm so lucky. I mean, these are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, freedom was meant to be for something. Mm -hmm. uh, freedom was not meant to say, you know, hey, I'm free. And so, listen, I've reached the ideal of my life. I've never let anybody constrain me. I've never committed myself to anybody. I've never, you know, had to, you know, once I got out of my parents' grip, you know, I was doing what I wanted, my strongest emotional desire. I got what I wanted all the time. I am me, and I did it myself and this is what I live for and I'm going to be Mr. Entitled Fauntleroy. So, you know, but the point pretty clearly is what a waste of life that is. You know, you get to the end of your life and you say, yeah, I served myself up a, a whole lot of stuff and I did whatever I wanted. I never did anything for anybody because if I had to, uh, you know, if I did something for somebody, I'd have to constrain myself mm -hmm. or commit myself to them or sacrifice something that I didn't want to sacrifice. I want it all. I'm entitled. I'm taking it. I'm negotiating it. That's the way it is, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, you know, uh, you, you can see right. that the Enlightenment ideal just taken one step too far is such a perversion that it turns our whole lives upside down until all we do is serve ourselves instead of trying to use our talents, our time, our energy to do maximum, optimal, positive difference to our families, to our friends, our, our communities, our cultures, uh, to our church, to the kingdom of God, uh, even to the society uh, and our organizations if we're so lucky. Right, so, so where does something like libertarianism fit into something like that? Well, libertarianism is, you know, it's almost on the uh, on the cusp of that, but mm -hmm. libertarianism is really a political movement. Mm -hmm. It's not so much talking about freedom as an ideal with respect to the self. It's basically libertarianism is keep your grubby mitts off of me, okay. you know, and mostly it's, it's, it's pointed at the government. So in other words, libertarianism uh, in, in its essence is trying to say to the government, you know, I, I don't need you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what were those words of Ronald Reagan that were the most frightening of all? Right. I'm the government and I'm here to help. Right. You know, and so the, uh, uh, the idea uh, for a libertarian is mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that's pretty, uh, uh, you know, you hear that and, uh, you know, bail, uh, you know, because they're not here to help. They're, they're here to basically take your rights away. Mm -hmm. So it's much more of a political um, uh, viewpoint. Uh, I have to tell you, the, the libertarians have always been on top of the administrative state problem mm. for a long, long time. And it is a big problem in the U.S. Mm. We don't have, you know, um, you know uh, uh, 
you know, a threefold um, uh, a governmental uh, system, you know, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative. We've got the judiciary, the executive, legislative, and the administrative. Mm. So we've got a fourfold uh, governmental system. Mm. And, you know, if uh, the libertarians are the ones that basically say, hey, you know, the administrative state is just as, you know, it requires controls and restraints just as much as the legislative, executive, and judicial. You know, and unfortunately, the judicial is not right now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to, you know, um, uh, control what's going on in the administrative state. We're just allowing all these administrative and procedural kinds of things uh, that pop up, you know, through executive mandates and, right. and through the administrative state itself. And you just look at, you know, the FBI can do this and that on the basis of this prescript or that order, right. you know, or executive order, et cetera, et cetera. And you look at that and you go, wow, you know, they got all this power. Yeah, they got all this power. So, like I said, you know, the libertarians, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously I'm not a libertarian, right. you know. Know, and uh, but I do think they have two things that uh, we ought to be uh, real conscious about that right. they're worth noting and uh, right. number one is yeah the, the the government can become a real severe limiter of mm -hmm. uh, human freedoms and number two the administrative state may be much more oppressive to your freedoms than the executive legislative and judicial branches ever thought of being okay. and those things might be some worthy thoughts but um, I don't recommend right. you know recommend that you become a libertarian <laughs> right 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 yeah, that's right we're not radicalizing anybody here on the show with that said and yeah. as we wrap up our, our Holy Week program if you'll give us your blessing on the way out the door father that'd be great oh yeah Absolutely. Uh, and uh, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And during this holy week and in this upcoming uh, Easter season, may the Lord send his Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire, guide, and protect you so that you might recognize his love pouring out for you on the cross, that you may avail yourself of all of the sacraments and uh, of his teaching that just show the way uh, to, uh, you know, the, sainthood and to that love so that you might truly not not only enter into the kingdom yourself but also help others to enter into that same kingdom so that every Easter blessing of resurrection may be upon you in this season in the name of the Father <clears throat> and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit amen. amen thank you so much father have a blessed Easter we'll see you next week and uh, Father Spitz's books and DVDs are always available through our EWTM Religious Catalog, as you can see on the screen, of course. And next week, we'll continue with the same topic about honesty, charity, objective, moral norms. This weekend, uh, I get to talk with Immaculate Ilabagiza about her wonderful series we've been running, I Forgive, and also her book on Our Lady of Cabello. So check that out as well. And as we enter the holiest time of the year, we want to keep it right here on EWTN for all our wonderful Lenten, obviously, basically now in Holy Week, Easter programming will bring you masses and other events from Rome, the Holy Land, Washington, D.C., all happening throughout this week, into this weekend. Check out EW10.com for events, showtimes in your area, and also check out On Demand and YouTube if we post them there, if you miss them. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time right here on Father's Spitzer's Universe. Have a blessed Easter.